Top officials of 34 nations in the Western Hemisphere gathered to negotiate a free trade area of the Americas Agreement, promising to eliminate trade and investment obstacles between their countries. FDAA supporters say the purpose of their efforts is to foster economic progress, enhance domestic prosperity, and raise living standards throughout the hemisphere. The grandiose promises of FTAA proponents are carefully worded to put casual observers at ease. After all, who doesn't want to raise their standard of living? The real goals driving the plan, however, are not so publicly promoted. And with the aggressive push to complete the agreement by January of 2005, Americans will have little time to learn how the FTAA will actually affect them. A hard look at how recent government programs have impacted prosperity, however, can help Americans quickly evaluate the credibility of the FTAA promises. At the dawn of the 21st century, an increasing number of Americans find their livelihoods and standard of living in jeopardy. Reports of factory closings, entrepreneurs out of business, and unemployed blue-collar and white-collar workers have become routine. What plagues America is much more than a temporary recession or natural economic forces affecting one or two industries. The traditional foundations of economic strength, heavy industry, manufacturing, mining, and agriculture are either struggling to survive or are fast disappearing. The plight of the American cattle rancher, once our primary supplier of beef and still the image of the American West, illustrates the growing problem. Following the 1993 congressional approval of NAFTA, the precursor to the FTAA, Canadian and Mexican beef imports gained 20% of the U.S. market. By the late 90s, the USDA reported that American beef producers were losing nearly $100 per head. Thousands of family ranches operating for generations have been driven out of business. the FTAA would further accelerate the demise of family-owned ranches by opening up the U.S. to a flood of imported meats from the rest of the hemisphere. Since the 1970s, radical policies designed to rewild our forests have decimated the American lumber industry. From Alaska to Florida, Maine to California, more and more lands, public and private, are being locked up and placed off limits to human use. These hands-off policies mean consumers must buy from foreign sources what could otherwise readily be obtained in their own backyard. Increasing regulation and taxation have made it more economical to import something as basic as lumber from faraway places like New Zealand and Japan. American oil producers once supplied much of our energy needs and the raw material for many domestic petroleum products. In recent decades, however, federal regulations have forced many independent oil producers to permanently close off or plug their source of income. Many of the remaining private oil producers extract only gallons as opposed to barrels of crude oil per day. Still, the combined output of their operations provides a significant resource for consumer products and valuable income for local communities. EPA policies, however, are killing these independently owned oil operations. In fact, every 30 minutes, a private well is closed in the U.S. The EPA routinely attacks responsible, law-abiding, and environmentally conscious oil producers with a barrage of legal notices and bureaucratic red tape. Often, these attacks fail to cite any conclusive harm to the environment, 
or even specific violations of law. Yet the high cost and time to respond to such federal pressure make it increasingly difficult for the independent producer to earn an income. Just ask World War II veteran Richard Kenemoff. In 2002, his 45 years of crude oil production came to a halt. In a phone conversation with a Justice Department agent, Kenemoth asked why his government saw fit to give 900 million taxpayer dollars to Russia, our one-time sworn enemy, to refurbish their oil industry while emasculating our own through regulatory overkill. Kenemoth said he would appreciate it if the government would just treat him like it treats its enemies. The consequences of overregulation are alarming. An increasing number of American businesses are being forced out of existence or driven to relocate outside the U.S. Jobs wanted. The unemployment rate goes down a notch, but America still loses nearly 100,000 more jobs. Are they gone for good? Tonight when we come back, tens of thousands of jobs lost, and some of them may never return. It's a story often seen on the nightly news. The terrible human and economic price paid by one community as business ships jobs overseas. Another large American company moves its operations overseas. The reports imply that natural economic forces are to blame and that little can be done about it. We need to run an American economy in a very different way because the answer is you're going to be put out of business in making tomatoes in Mississippi and you need to move into something different. But the relatively sudden hemorrhage of American production to other countries actually stems from readily identifiable causes. Senior editor of the New American magazine and author of America's Engineered Decline, William Norman Grigg. There's nothing at all new about, uh, about the displacement of manufacturing workers. That's something which has happened throughout the industrial era. What is new is we're seeing the flight of industrial capital from the United States to places like communist China. And it's not that these American manufacturers are building products to sell to the Chinese. They're building products in China to import back to the United States. And even a cursory understanding of economics would lead one to ask the question, why are they doing this? Why is it more cost effective to set up in a communist country and then to pay the expense of transporting these goods back to the United States rather than building and selling the products here? In large measure, that's because as unfathomable as this might be to many Americans, our regulatory environment in the United States is more inhospitable than the regulatory environment in communist China. A 2003 study by the National Association of Manufacturers concludes that the biggest problem confronting American industry isn't foreign competition, but the growing costs imposed mostly by federal, but also by state government. These government-imposed burdens stand in sharp contrast to the freedom that originally gave rise to American enterprise and prosperity. During America's drive for independence, there was a remarkable speech given in the British Parliament in which it was pointed out that the prosperity of the American colonies was a product of the neglect of Great Britain's government. It was because government stayed out of our commercial transactions and was limited in what it could do that uh, the American middle class took root and flourished. In just three generations, Americans managed to surpass the world's total progress for 6,000 years. With less than 7% of the Earth's population, Americans were able to create more wealth than all the other billions of people in the world. Yet increasingly, today's leaders have rejected these lessons of history. The spirit of American know-how and can-do is being sapped by an appetite for regulating all human activity. A new word that's entered the American vocabulary over the last couple of years is offshoring. It's also known as outsourcing, and that consists of a process where American-owned companies are, instead of hiring American information technology workers or machinists or customer service workers, are sending these jobs abroad to China, to India, to the Philippines, to the former Soviet Union, and so forth. 
So rather than hiring American citizens with good qualifications, they'll end up hiring somebody in India or Mexico or China who makes a fraction of what an American would make. And the American worker in question is left to pick up a job as a retail clerk or flipping hamburgers. A 2003 study published by UC Berkeley analyzes the next wave of non-manufacturing jobs going overseas. It concludes that earlier predictions that 3.3 million jobs would be lost to offshoring by 2015 are too conservative. The study estimates that as many as 14 million white-collar jobs are at risk. One of the things that has happened that is really pernicious is that our government, through the H-1B and L-1 visa programs, have been training the foreign nationals who go back to their own countries and then take jobs that would otherwise be given to Americans who are very well qualified. Our own government is creating a huge pool of low-wage technical labor that is sucking a lot of these jobs offshore. And the American taxpayer is being required to subsidize the creation of the foreign labor force that is stealing our jobs. The world of globalization, some of the old economic models used in the past don't apply to Unfortunately, the same politics that have been choking the American economy also drive the FTAA. The uh, 19th century French free market economist Frederick Bastier once said that government increases its power by creating the poison and the antidote in the same laboratory. The same government that has adulterated our currency through inflation and has been driving our jobs ashore through crippling regulations on our manufacturing sector and that help create, through subsidy, the pool of low-wage foreign labor that is attracting our jobs abroad. That's the same government that is proposing the FTAA as a solution. And it's the same mindset gripping our government that gave Americans NAFTA, the predecessor to FTAA. The so-called free trade movement is devoted to creating huge trade blocks that would be subject to incredibly onerous regulation by international governments. If you take a look at the so-called North American Free Trade Agreement, here are the two volumes of the basic NAFTA accords, the basic text of this agreement. This isn't free trade, this is very tightly regulated trade. As oppressive as the U.S. regulatory climate has become, the FTAA would impose a whole new world of regulation. It's challenging enough for Americans who are dealing with our own government in terms of protecting our property and our prosperity, but it would be almost hopeless to deal with the impositions that would be placed on us by a supranational government composed of foreigners who really have no interest in whether our country endures as a free and prosperous society. Despite these revolutionary consequences, the FTAA has had unwavering support from several U.S. administrations. In 1992, President George H. Bush signed NAFTA, the forerunner of the FTAA. And with the timely help of fellow internationalists and the Republican leadership, President Clinton pressured Congress to approve NAFTA. Then, in 1994, Clinton hosted the Summit of the Americas in Miami, and the drive to expand NAFTA into the FTAA was launched publicly. Proponents described the FTAA as a broadening and deepening of NAFTA. The FTAA would broaden NAFTA, which applies only to the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, by including every country in the Western Hemisphere with the current exception of Cuba. The FTAA would deepen NAFTA by claiming jurisdiction over an ever-increasing number of functions that have previously been under the control of national, state, and local governments. At the 2001 Quebec Summit of the Americas, President George W. Bush committed his administration to completing negotiations for a fully operational FTAA. From the beginning, proponents created the impression that government developed the FTAA proposal in response to a need and the demands of the people. 
However, the inspiration for the FTAA did not originate with elected officials. A special televised meeting of the New York-based Council on Foreign Relations provides a window to the real story. The speaker, Vice President Dick Cheney, takes a question from David Rockefeller. Vice President, um, I just enjoyed so much your whole speech, but I was particularly pleased that you gave such a strong endorsement for the free trade agreement for all the Americas, subject that has been of great concern to me for many years, and particularly recently, and I think it's absolutely essential for the strength of our economy. Rockefeller's role in the drive for an FTAA was a lot more central than he portrays. Rockefeller cultivated Latin American leaders who could be counted on to support such a proposal. Both the 1994 Miami Summit and the FTAA proposal were conceived and nurtured by a Rockefeller-created network. Prominent among the organizations sponsoring the Miami event were the Council of the Americas, founder and honorary chairman, David Rockefeller, the Americas Society, chairman, David Rockefeller, the Forum of the Americas, founder, David Rockefeller, the Institute for International Economics, financial backer and board member, David Rockefeller, the Trilateral Commission, founder and honorary chairman, David Rockefeller. Rockefeller's influence also extends to the current administration. He was chairman emeritus of the CFR when Vice President Dick Cheney once served as a director, a relationship that Cheney concealed during his congressional career. It's good to be back at the Council on Foreign Relations. As uh, Pete mentioned, I've been a member for a long time and was actually a director for some period of time. I never mentioned that when I was campaigning for re-election back home in Wyoming. <laughs> From time to time, FTAA proponents get carried away in their enthusiasm and hint at the full revolutionary journey they have planned for America. One such admission came from Henry Kissinger, a member of the Executive Committee of the Trilateral Commission and a heavyweight in the CFR. In a 1993 syndicated column, Kissinger predicted that NAFTA will represent the most creative step toward a new world order taken by any group of countries since the end of the Cold War. NAFTA is not a conventional trade agreement, he admitted, but the architecture of a new international system. In other words, the prospect of prosperity is the bait on the hook, and once we're on that hook, they will take us in a direction that would lead us to a more socialist world government administered regionally through the FTAA. At the time of the first FTAA summit in 1994, President Clinton's chief of staff, Thomas F. McClarty, explained. This summit is much broader than lowering tariffs, and that's how it should be looked at. This is not a trade summit. It is an overall summit. It will focus on economic integration and convergence. When globalists seek to rally support for their schemes, they often use code terms such as convergence, integration, harmonization, we hear about convergence, we hear about harmonization. Words of that sort describe an end to America's existence as an independent country. Words of that sort describe the blending, the commingling of the United States with the political and economic systems of other countries. And particularly with respect to this word harmonization, we're talking about a radical decline, an engineered decline in America's standard of living. You can read in the literature about something called downward harmonization. That's something we run into quite a bit as wages fall, as prosperity declines, as uh, people who are once middle class join something called the race to the bottom. And that's something which has happened a great deal here in the United States in the post-NAFTA era. The fear is that a fully implemented FTAA would break the backbone of America altogether. America's middle class was a consequence of freedom and liberty government. What's driving the agenda of the people behind the FTAA is exactly the opposite vision. They want to accumulate power in the hands of government to regulate these large economic blocks. In other words, they want to create conditions that would lead to the extinction of the middle class as opposed to prolonging and, and expanding the conditions which led to the emergence of the American middle class. Early Americans were blessed with a culture of self-reliance. They created government to protect their rights and opportunities to thrive. 
not to stifle initiative by confiscating the fruits of their labor. The internationalists have rejected these lessons of history and seek to regulate the world. If our government continues to follow this agenda, the American middle class faces extinction. opportunity for Americans to stop the FTAA is to convince the U.S. Congress to reject any agreement that would establish an FTAA. Only organized action can build sufficient informed pressure on Congress in the time remaining. The John Birch Society offers such a program and its success depends on your participation.